Full spellcasters just end up becoming ridiculous and the oracle's no exception as we start moving into their 4th and 5th level spells. Hello everyone, and welcome back down here to the Gamer's Den with me, your host, Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire, once again diving back into the first edition Pathfinder Oracle today, as the intro said, talking about their fourth and fifth level spells, and my god, it's just absolutely amazing what a full spell casting class can get done, the array of options at their fingertips, and to top it off as an oracle, you have your array of uh, revelations available to you as well. Top it off, you're not the worst melee combat endeavor. I mean, you're not the best, but with the array of buffs and abilities that you have at your fingertips, so you can still get in there and compete and affect the flow of battle by either manipulating the action economy, throwing down buffs or debuffs, and just making things a living nightmare for any opponents that dare to stand in your way. But before we get into exactly what we have on offer for you today, if you're new here to the channel, go on down there, hit the subscribe button, and become a regular member here at the Gamer's Den. Or if you've already listed yourself on such an incredible roster of legendary heroes, then go on down to hit the like button and share the video far and wide. But now, let's actually start talking about your spells. And we're going to begin with, of course, 4th level spells, and we're starting with Debilitating Portent. Select one target within 100 feet plus 10 feet per level. They must make a will save DC 10 plus one half your oracle level plus your charisma modifier. Each time they make an attack or cast a spell, on failure they deal half damage with the attack or spell. No save or spell resistance applies. Now, there is one additional effect that I didn't list here. If the opponent has scored a critical hit, you can essentially discharge the spell effect to negate the critical hit and force the opponent to still t uh, deal only half damage. So that's a pretty good kicker right there, although depending on the situation at hand, it may be worthwhile to leave the effect on them, but 9 times out of 10, negating a critical hit is going to be the route you want to go, especially since you are a spontaneous spellcaster, so you're going to have a wider number number of spell slots available to you as you advance in levels. So being willing to throw this particular debuff out on some melee focused opponents is going to be a pretty worthwhile thing. So don't be afraid to discharge that extra spell effect to negate a particularly devastating critical hit. Then we have Divine Power. Target yourself and for one round of level, call upon your deity's power to gain might in combat. Gives a plus one bonus for every three caster levels up to a maximum of plus six on attack, damage, strength checks, and strength skill checks. Also gives one temporary hit point per caster level. And on a full attack, make an extra attack at your highest base attack bonus. Doesn't stack with haste effects or weapons of speed, but this pretty quickly replaces any of your previous combat buffs as far as spells go, especially since you can only target yourself. And again, because you're a spontaneous spellcaster, you can be uh, pretty comfortable in using this particular spell freely on yourself through multiple combats, knowing that you're going to have an effective modifier to your melee attack. So when you get in close to the enemy spellcasters and you use use your various revelations and other spells to really disrupt their schemes, create favorable positioning for your allies, you can hit them and really punish them. And you things only really escalate and get worse from here. When we move on to Baphomet's Blessing. Touch one living creature and on a failed fortitude save, for one round of level, the target's head transforms into a bull's head, reducing their intelligence to a 2 and get, uh, giving them a gore attack, 1d6 for small creatures, 1d8 for medium, and 2d6 for large creatures, adding their strength modifier and a plus two bonus towards making those gore attacks. The target still has its normal attack bonus, class ability, spell casting, and can cast spells. Now, this may be more specifically effective against wizards or any spell casters that rely on their intelligence score, but reducing their intelligence score to a two 
does so much to cripple their spell casting. You're reducing the number of bonus spells that they have. Their spell save DCs, any number or any of the save DCs for their spell like abilities, or if they have any abilities that depend on their intelligence score, those are all severely crippled now. And that is an incredibly worthwhile thing. And this just leans into the role that we're building for a time mystery focused oracle into being an anti spell caster kind of role. And to go along with supporting that and your allies, we have, of course, Summon Monster 4. Summon creatures at a point within 25 feet plus 5 feet every two levels. You are going to summon either a giant scorpion, hound archon, grizzly bear, medium elemental, or 1d3 creatures from Summon Monster 3, or 1d4 plus 1 creatures from Summon Monster 2. Now, the Summon Monster 2 creatures probably are not going to be able to do a lot in terms of effectiveness against your opponents, especially since as a spontaneous spellcaster, you are advancing your spell levels much more slowly in comparison to a cleric or a wizard. So by the time you get access to 4th level spells, the creatures from the Summon Monster 2 list probably aren't going to be doing too much to your opponents. They're not going to really be able to hit them. But if they're positioned correctly to where they're providing flanking bonuses or have any abilities like blind sense, tremor sense, or any kind of uh, supporting or spell casting abilities, which Summon Monster 2 doesn't really have much of, if any, uh, you are still going to be able to yield a great deal of benefit. And if your opponents spend any time attacking a summoned creature, well, that's still a net benefit for you and your allies because an attack against a summon monster is not an attack against a, 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 play, a player character. Got tongue-tied for a moment there. But we go on from 4th level spells to 5th level, and we start off with a hell of a doozy here in Heretic's Tongue. Target one living creature in 25 feet plus 5 feet for every two levels. On a failed will save for one round a level, the target's mind becomes flooded with blasphemies, and they lose the ability to cast spells or lose spell-like abilities. When targeting a divine caster, the spellcaster can name an alignment. If that matches up with part of the divine caster or their deity's alignment, the divine caster also loses access to all supernatural and spell-like class abilities for the duration. So smite, blessings, domain powers, etc. Those are all gone. The spell target can then end the effect in half the duration by verbalizing the litany of blasphemies. They are treated as paralyzed and allies in 50 feet must make a will save or be shaken until the end of the effect. So not only is this an incredible debuff against enemy spellcasters, especially divine casters, negating several of their class abilities that really give them extra oomph, this can also end up paralyzing the target and have an added effect for their allies. Now, not all of their allies are going to fall prey to it, but this is going to be a significant debuff that just radiates off of one target. This is absolutely a must-have for anybody wanting to be an anti-spellcaster. And then, after that little bit of awesome there, we move on to Clockwork Wall. At a point with sufficient space to do so within 100 feet plus 10 feet per level, conjure a wall of spinning bronze clockwork gears up to 5 feet long per caster level. Creatures passing through uh, take 1d6 damage per caster level to a max of 10d6. The wall gives cover, uh, plus 4 bonus to AC and plus 2 to reflex saves on attacks made through it. It's 1 inch thick per caster level with 30 point or hit points per inch and a hardness 9. Now the uh, length of the wall can be increased if you have the thickness of the wall, so just kind of plan things out accordingly. And then on a natural 20, if the crit is confirmed with an attack on the wall, the section of wall struck gains the broken condition. A section that is already broken becomes destroyed instead. So that is one hang up for the wall. However, it is handy to note that it is only on a natural 20. Doesn't matter what the weapon's critical threat range is, but uh, uh, only on a natural 20, so one, one attack out of every 20, 
will actually uh, break the wall or eventually destroy it. So it's something to keep in mind there. But overall, this is still great. This is still a lot of battlefield control and a significant amount of damage to be consistently throwing out. And if you have any high strength characters with you, like a paladin, barbarian, a fighter, or anybody like that who can do bull rushing or really shove a target around, they can make their attacks and slam them into the wall for repeated consistent damage. And that will be a massive benefit to your party. In fact, the only real weakness to this is that because it does so much damage and it's made up of so many moving parts is that there's not a lot of utility for this beyond uh, beyond dealing damage and blocking off and kind of, con again, controlling the flow of the battlefield. So that's something to bear him. Also, uh, flying enemies can go over it. And of course, ethereal enemies won't really have a problem passing through it. But if you do need a wall with more utility, consider stone wall. While you can still make a wall with it, you can do so much more with it as well. It's got so much more utility than the clockwork wall does. It just doesn't do the same kind of damage. So bear both of those spells in mind and uh, make heavy use of both of them. They're both fantastic to have. But of course, we have another one that's just so much utility for you as well, and that's summon monster five. Summon uh, creatures at a point within 25 feet plus 5 feet every two levels. You will summon either an Ankylosaurus, a Salamander, the evil outsider variety, a Vulpinal Agathion, or 1d3 creatures from Summon Monster 4, or 1d4 plus 1 from Summon Monster 3. Now, the creatures from Summon Monster 4 and 3 are still going to have a fair bit of use for you, more so than Summon Monster 2 and 1 will. So all of these are going to be incredibly useful for you though because uh, Vulpinal Agathian and the Salamander they have some spell like abilities handy to them and extra effects to, and the like so definitely worthwhile to have and the Ankylosaurus is just a big tanky beast to throw down out there definitely will be an able and capable summoned companion for you to have supporting the party then another spell to consider as a self buff would be Righteous Might for one round of level, your size increases to the next category, so from medium to large. You gain a plus four size bonus to strength and constitution while taking a minus two penalty to your dex, and that hurts a bit because dex is just a prime stat and a part of your defense. However, to compensate, you get a plus two enhancement bonus to your natural armor and a damage reduction of five, uh, or uh, uh, unless the target's evil or good, striking with natural attacks if you channel positive or divine energy, which you'll have chosen at first level. And then at 15th level, this damage reduction becomes 10, uh, unless the opponent has evil or good natural attacks that they're uh, laying into you with. Now, the damage reduction there, I kind of go back and forth on it, and uh, a regular viewer, Captain Crank, has made a point about how creatures that are evil lined with natural attacks are not the most super common thing, and the da just having a flat damage reduction in place is going to be useful because most opponents are attacking you with some sort of weaponry. And so that will help protect you in a wide variety of instances even when you are fighting against evil creatures so that's pretty useful it's still i still think in some situations you're going to be at a disadvantage but you know you're a full spell casting class you're going to have options for dealing with it and mitigating it and overall this is still going to prevent so much damage from coming down on you and the fact that you're getting a size increase to uh well just to your physical size affecting your reach and the threatened area that you occupy and then getting bonuses to your strength and constitution and to ac that's pretty fantastic all the way around coupling this with all of your other abilities and your spells you are going to be an incredible incredibly threatening force on the battlefield and a surprisingly effective melee combatant, especially if you combine this with a reach weapon like a spear of some variety. But what do you think? Go on down to the comments below and let me know your thoughts. Did you like today's video? Did you dislike it? As always, this is just a small selection of spells that are going to be mechanically effective for you either as a time mystery anti-caster kind of build or for any oracle generally if for in for that matter. Although some of the more combat oriented buffing spells may be a little bit less effective if you're leaning more into being 
uh, a spellcaster. You're just going into that utility, debuffing, control kind of spellcaster. Staying away from the front lines, sitting back uh, from far afield, and just laying all kinds of waste and destruction down upon your enemies while uplifting your allies. Certainly there's a lot of ways to go with the oracle. But still, these are pretty good spells, but there are more out there. So go on down to the comments below. Let me know your thoughts, what spells you would also highly recommend for an oracle. And remember that if you're new here to the channel, go on down there, hit the subscribe button, and become a regular member here at the Gamer's Den. But with all that said, I've been your host, Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire. Thank you all so very much for your time, and you all have yourselves a good night.